O God, compassionate Father and friend, remember not our sins, but rather remember your love and mercy. Relieve our distress and satisfy us with eternal peace through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <coughs> we continue with the reading of the Passion History according to the four Gospels. The section before us today is entitled, The Trial Before Pilate. They led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves, and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. <clears throat> this happened so that his words Jesus had spoken, indicating the kind of death he was going to die, would be fulfilled. Then the chief priests and elders began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar, and claims to be Christ, a king. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Do you think I am a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this he went out to the Jews and announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. The chief priests and elders accused Jesus of many things. Pilate asked him, Don't you hear how many things they are accusing you of? Jesus gave no answer. So again, Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. The chief priests and elders insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. <coughs> that day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers of the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence, and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us, as you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him, and then release him. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists, who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate said to them, 
It is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, the King of the Jews, who is called Christ? Pilate knew it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, because I have suffered a great deal today in a dream on account of him. But the chief priests and elders stirred up the crowd and persuaded them to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Now, Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ, the one you call the King of the Jews? Crucify him, they shouted. Crucify him, crucify him. For a third time he spoke to them. Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore I will have him punished and then release him. But they shouted all the louder. Crucify him! And their shouts prevailed. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace of the governor, the Praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head, put a staff in his right hand, and knelt in front of him, worshiping. They spit on him, struck him in the face, and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. They mocked him and, called, and began to call on him, Hail, King of the Jews! Once more Pilate came out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law. And according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You have no power over me. That was not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you will are no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. When Pilate saw he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, Pilate granted their demand, wanting to satisfy the crowd. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. 
Then Pilate released Barabbas, the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. He then surrendered Jesus to their will to be crucified. The soldiers of the governor took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. So far the reading of the Passion History of our Lord. We all like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. We continue with the next one. Entertainment is what we 
take our mind off things that are really serious and kind of disengage them for a few moments and put them on something that doesn't require much thought at all. Just kind of occupy our time. And there's nothing wrong with that, necessarily, a little bit anyway. But how about this? In a society in which we live, do you think that there are people who know more about the stats and rosters of the NFL than they do about the books of the Bible? Or more about the life of Luke Skywalker than they do about Jesus? Or could rattle off all the different weapons in the video game Call of Duty more than they could talk about the sacrament of baptism and communion? Could list the biographies of five of the girls on the bachelor quicker than they could name five of the disciples. Or whatever your hobby might happen to be. The answer, that's, that's, uh, that's a question we all know the answer to. Of course, our country is filled with people who could uh, do all of those things before they could do the most serious things, talk about the more serious issues of God and His Word. But here's the, the bigger question. Sometimes do we know more about stuff like that than we do about the Lord and His Word? And if it's true, then that would be ironic. Ironic is the word. Irony is the word that's been showing up in our Latin series this year. The definition of irony is when there is an inconsistency between what you might expect to happen and what actually occurs. We see all kinds of that irony as we follow our Lord Jesus and watch Him on that road to Calvary's cross during the season of Lent. Things that should be important to people aren't. Things that they should be paying attention to and listening to, they're not. And we see it today when we see this little interchange between Jesus and Herod. That's our irony of Lent today. Jesus in front of Herod. Herod, who for a long time had been wanting to see Jesus, and now he gets the chance. Jesus stands there right in front of him. He can ask him anything he wants. And all he really wants is entertainment. So, let's look. The irony of Herod wanting to see Jesus. He hoped to see a miracle. God wanted to show him his Savior. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. That was Herod's interest. Ironically, it was entertainment. He wasn't interested in the message. He was interested in the miracle. He wasn't interested in the man. He was interested in an entertainer, a performer. And here is Jesus who, throughout his entire ministry, had captivated the ears of people, the attention of souls from the lowest to the highest. People who had been known to live these lifestyles that they were obviously against the Lord, were still hanging on the words of Jesus and being comforted and warmed by his forgiving love. Tax collectors, prostitutes. Even when he was 12 years old in the temple. There he was, listening, talking, the people were amazed. Miracle after miracle. People were amazed not just by the miracle, but by the message which that miracle validated. Herod, for a long time, wanted to see Pilate. But the reason was only entertainment. Herod. We keep hearing his name. This is the son of the Herod that was alive at the time of Jesus' birth. Remember, that was the Herod. He had a little bit more power. He's the one who saw to the death of the two-year-olds and under in Bethlehem. That Herod died very shortly after Christ's birth. This Herod was a weaker, lesser ruler. The Romans had solidified their control over all of Israel. Remember what the map of Israel looks like? You guys know it from, right? So up there is Galilee. In the middle is the place they always wanted to kind of walk around, Samaria, and in the bottom was Judea, right? That's where um, Jerusalem and Bethlehem are. Well, Herod only rules up here in Galilee. And only because the Romans kind of let him do that. But the real authority is Rome. That's why the governor, Pontius Pilate, is really in control. That's why Jesus is standing in front of Pilate. But Pilate doesn't want to have anything to do with this what he considered a Jewish religious problem. Take him and judge him by your own, you law, he says. Well, they got this problem. They can't execute. They're not supposed to be able to execute anybody. They need the Roman okay. That's why he's got to be there in front of Pilate. 
Pilate wants him away. And when he finds out that he's a Galilean, that would be under the jurisdiction of Herod up here in Galilee. And Herod happens to be down in J Jerusalem and Judea at the time. Herod is in the perfect place where Pilate is to pass off his problem with Jesus to Herod. And Herod's okay with that because for a long time he had been wanting to see Jesus. And this incident was enough to make these two men friends. They couldn't find their common ground in their government work. They couldn't somehow get along in their role as rulers under the Romans. But they found their unity in both being willing to condemn a man in whom they knew they could find no fault. That itself is ironic. So now he gets sent over to Herod. Herod plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. He wasn't about to, as it says in another place in the Bible, cast the pearls before the swine. The pearls of the gospel before ears that have no interest in hearing. He knew that Herod had no interest in the real answers. So Jesus remained silent. He knew that he was only interested in what he thought to be a magic trick. Here is Herod at the most important juncture of world history. Jesus taking on human flesh, the eternal God becoming a man to take our place and to be sacrificed for our sins. Here is Jesus. That's the focal point of the history of the world, past and present and future. And all he wants is entertainment. He missed the right things, looking for the wrong things. Are there Herods still floating around in the world today? I guess that's a question that we can only answer to too. You know, Jesus has always been probably the most popular person ever since he was born in world history. Even more popular than the Beatles, for those who remember that. He has been written about, he has been quoted, he has been imitated, he has even respected. And in a religious setting, many people want to somehow connect themselves to the words and actions of Jesus as part of their spiritual life, but often for the wrong reasons. Jesus is more than just an example. Jesus is more than just a good man to follow. He's more than just a teacher of morality. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, the Apostle Paul said. <coughs> Unless you want that title. Or maybe I want it. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. And if that's not the main reason why I want to see Jesus, why you want to see Jesus, then we're looking for Jesus for the wrong reason. Jesus came into this world as a sacrifice for my sins. He came for your sins. He came to wash you clean. From whatever it is that's on your record, it's different for each one of us, but on the other hand, it's all the same. We stand before God as imperfect sinners in need of what only Jesus can do for us. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And if I find myself looking for Jesus for any other reason than that, first and foremost, I'm sliding down the pathway of Herod. May God always preserve in us a, a better appreciation of, of, of a strong focus on our Lord Jesus and why He came and what that means to us. So often, I just heard someone tell me the other day, again, or write to me the other day, I can be a good Christian. I live a good Christian life. I'm a kind person. I don't need God's word. I don't, I don't need to hear Jesus' voice because I'm good. I'm a Christian. Hopefully Christians are good. But what I need from Jesus first and foremost is Christ Jesus came to this world to save sinners, to cleanse me from my sin, to stand perfect in my place. In our world, in our country especially, is filled with so many distractions that 
We have too much wealth, we have too much time, we have too many entertainment outlets. And it's so easy for us to forget what's really important, even when it comes to our Lord Jesus. That is the mistake that Herod made. There Jesus is standing right in front of him. Herod could ask him anything, and God would have told him anything. And all he wanted was the entertainment. And Jesus stood there and did nothing for him. He would not cast the pearls before the swine. So what did Herod do next? He just started messing around. He didn't get the entertainment he wanted from Jesus. He and his soldiers made their own entertainment. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked Jesus, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. They say that there is none who are so blind as those who will not see. Here Herod had every opportunity. Pontius Pilate was in the same boat. Every opportunity. And they were looking for the wrong things and they missed the right thing. But what God wanted them to see, what God wanted Herod to see, he wanted to see a miracle. What God wanted him to see was a Savior. He wanted him to see what's really valuable and important. You know, when they, they do these surveys in our, in our culture. I don't know how they come up with this stuff, but it, it, it rings true, whatever the numbers might be. But they say that it's not uncommon for people to spend hours and hours watching television and sports on TV and only spending, I've seen 20 minutes or less, or I've seen it down to 4 minutes or less, in meaningful interaction with the people in the world. Does that ring true? The real value in the house is the people, not what's on the screen where we can mindlessly take our attention and focus it for so long. Doesn't even have to be on the screen, does it guys? Girls back there, to be right there in your hand, right? There's always something on that screen. I don't know what it is. It's only this big. There's something on it. We've got to look at it all the time. Here, Jesus is standing right in front of the king. God wanted him to see what was important. And Herod misses it. Because all he wanted was the entertainment. He plied him with many questions. But Jesus gave him no answer. Royal courts always had these advisors around, their wise men, the, the counselors. Maybe he thought Jesus could answer all the questions of life that his own wise counselors couldn't. He could have. Why is him with many questions? But that's not why Jesus came. He didn't come to give him all kinds of good economic advice, political advice. He didn't come to give Jesus all kinds of fortune telling for the future, military advice, whatever it might be. He came as a savior, and here he missed it. And he sent him back to Pilate. And ironically, that was enough to make these two men friends again. They thought, both Pilate and Herod, thought that the best thing that happened to them that day was these two men who had been at odds with each other, now are friends. That was the best thing that happened to them on that day that the Savior came to die for the sins of the world. What's the best thing that happened to you today? Really, I know the day's not over yet, but what is the best thing that happened to you today? Every day. Isn't it the fact that you have and you continue to see your Savior through the eyes of faith? And you know, as a baptized child of God, of God, as a member of His family, you know that you have that Savior that was so desperately wanted to be shown to Herod. You know, day in and day out, every single day when you get up each morning, that because of the mercy of God who sent Christ as our Savior, He will not treat us as our sins deserve, because He has already taken all of our guilt and laid it on His Son. That is continually the best thing that has always happened. Herod missed it all. But by God's grace, we have not missed it. And may we never. And as we walk this road with Jesus again, and then watch him on that way to Calvary's cross, may it be all the more vivid for us. Jesus has done this for us because he loves us. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom we all are the worst. And yet we all are cleansed by the blood of that Lamb. If the definition of irony is an inconsistency between what 
you might expect, and what actually occurs, then the greatest irony in the history of the world is that God, who should punish and judge each one of us because of our guilt, instead puts it on His Son so that we can all be free. Herod wanted to see Jesus, ironically, for all the wrong reasons. We have seen Jesus by God's grace, and we will see him face to face because Christ Jesus came into this world to save us. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated as we bring forward our offering.
desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Peter's as well. So may God bless your calling process that's coming up starting this 
this on Sunday. Should we join together in the common table prayers as we go down to the week? Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. We'll give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy.